So uh, my name is, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sue Riddlestone. I am the Chief Executive and Co-Founder of Bioregional uh, and I'll be your chair for the day and uh, also introducing uh, a little bit about Bioregional and One Planet Living. Uh, then we're going to hear from two One Planet leaders. Uh, we're going to hear from Jonathan Westindy uh, of about Windmill uh, and the One Planet the projects and the One Planet Living Fund. Uh, and then from uh, Ian Pritchett, who's going to talk about uh, the Springfield Meadows um, project. So somebody's saying, can't stay for the whole session. Please send out a link to the recording. Yes, we will. And we will be recording. In fact, we already are, I think. Uh, and we'll send out the slides and, and uh, the recording to everyone who's registered at the end. Uh, so we have... Um, then we have Joe Pitts Cunningham, who's going to form by regional, who's going to tell us a little bit about the One Planet Living Leaders Hub and uh, how you can become a leader like Ian and Jonathan, uh, if you wish to. And then we have a bit, bit more time for Q and A and uh, wrap up on a discussion. And we had quite a good discussion at the session earlier this morning uh, in the UK time uh, with a whole bunch of people from Australia uh, and more that side of the world and a few from the UK. So um, next slide, please, James, thank you. So Bioregional, uh, for those that don't know, we are a social enterprise and a sustainability charity. Uh, we've been going for 28 years now. Um, you can see our BedZ Eco Village uh, on the right there, which is a uh, sort of in the inspiration for us, for our, for our work on sustain our first project and inspiration for us um, to create One Planet Living Framework. Uh, and we have been working with, we do uh, work with partners to create sustainable places, sustainable products and services, all of which is to enable people to live happy, healthy lives within the natural limits of our planet. Making sure we're also leaving some space for nature, for wildlife and wilderness. And that's what we call One Planet Living. And that's very much our vision as an organisation. It's a vision for One Planet Living itself, which is a, a framework which is um, free for anyone to use. And uh, you're going to hear, hear a bit more about that today. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we work we work on our own initiatives uh, that we started and work with partners on that. But we also work in an advisory capacity because people always want to try and do these things and want us to, to help them with it. So from um, developers like uh, Landsec, um, Homes England, uh, Crest, Clarion, social housing providers to um, build construction companies like Carey's, Hill Group, um, landowners like the Portman Estate in who own great swathes of central London, um, through to retailers um, like uh, B&Q and Kingfisher, uh, which is a bit like Home Depot in the States, uh, Wilco similarly, um, and um, restaurateurs as well, like Nando's. And uh, so uh, quite a broad spread of people that we work with. Next slide, please. Uh, so just, you know, why do we talk about One Planet Living? Well, yeah, we carbon is really important. We've just had COP26. We know that we need to halve carbon emissions globally by 2030. So that's important, but also we know we need a circular economy and that we're having a big impact with all of the cutting down trees, fishing out fisheries, uh, mining and all the resources, the land take of, of us humans. And you can see here the ecological footprint for the world, which brings together the uh, carbon, which you can see in the blue and the resources. Um, so that would be the cropland, the fishing grounds, the built up lands, the forest products, grazing land. Uh, and you sort of marry the two together uh, and globally we're consuming 70 percent more now annually than the planet can absorb or replenish so that's why we're seeing the impacts of climate change and, and disappearing forests and fisheries and if you then next slide look at um, the different countries are consuming at different rates so the north america and canada average is up there at four or five planets if everyone lived uh, like we do in North America, then it would be four or five planets that we'd actually need to live on. And we obviously don't have that. Uh, in Europe, where we are, the average is, uh, where I'm speaking from today, the average is uh, about three planets. 
And of course, in many countries, you can see that line there would be the green line is that that would be one planet living. Um, and that actually goes on where there are a number of countries who don't have enough. So they need to develop and grow. So so that's the vision of one planet living um, that, that we become more resource efficient and it's totally possible uh, in the richer nations and leave a bit of space for people to develop and grow as well as space for nature. And um, the biologist E.O. Wilson, who passed away recently, has had a campaign for 50 percent of um, land to be conserved for nature, which should be doable um, uh, with by 2050. And uh, that's what we need to actually maintain um, biodiversity um, on, on our planet. Next slide, please. So if we look at how that breaks down, this is the example of the UK. You can see that housing is about a quarter of that three planet footprint. It's transport in the UK is about 22 percent. It's probably a bit higher in countries like uh, North, in North America and Australia, where there's a bit more spread out development and flying between cities than we have here in the UK. Uh, food uh, is 18 percent. I've sometimes seen it a bit higher because that's the land take as well as the greenhouse gas emissions. 12 percent for all the stuff we buy, the iPads, the TVs uh, and, and so on, uh, clothes. And then the remainder is uh, the sort of shared infrastructure that we all use. And so we need to add that to our footprint. Um, but I can tell you that living here at Bedstead, as I do, um, and working here so I can walk to work and um, participating in what's enabled for a one planet lifestyle, I, I've managed to get down to 1.1 planet living. And uh, you can go and do your footprint on the Global Footprint Network calculator to work out your own if you're interested. So I don't know, James, if you can pop that link in the chat for the calculator. Uh, and next slide, please. Um, so One Planet Living um, came about because um, after we did the BedZ project, many people said, oh, can you help us to do a BedZ? So we systematised uh, what we did here, the strategies we had here, and also um, drew in the work that we've been doing on products to create a framework which is based on, basically it's what people consume, what people need. So it's very, it's people that are creating the impact and so, you know, we need to design things for us as people. So that goes from health and happiness through to zero carbon energy, 10 easy to understand principles covering uh, with a holistic approach to sustainability. Uh, and then it's relating to that one planet um, bottom line and um, structuring responses to those needs. And the approach that we take to use it is to uh, have a process where you would have a workshop, perhaps gather some information, have a workshop, create a one planet action plan uh, for your new development, for your company, uh, for your local area, for yourself. And then you can use that to um, then have champions for the different principles, perhaps, and make sure it's embedded into uh, everything that you're doing. Um, across your operations, it's not sort of siloed out as the sustainability strategy. And so here you can see the 10 principles with a bit more detail. So, so I'll just go through them. Health and happiness is often how what it all adds up to in the end. Uh, equity in the local economy, it's really important you know, to pay fair wages to foster and create a local economy. It's not just about building homes or you know, it's about incomes and livelihoods as well creating a culture of uh, respecting the local culture and bringing that in, but also creating a culture of sustainability and fostering community. And we often find the transport strategies to sort of move the roads, de-emphasise roads and create more public places where people can meet really fosters community. Uh, making when you when we're working, when we have land to look at, you know, wise use of the land and making a home for nature as well as for humans. The way we um, manage how we use water um, in the buildings, but also um, so reducing down demand, but also making sure that uh, we're not creating flooding and we're managing the watersheds properly. Next slide, please. Uh, then obviously food's very important. We need to eat every day. Um, so that would probably be looking at a more 
more plant based, healthier diets uh, than the very sort of we've just become eating more and more meat, which is having this massive impact on the world, but also local and seasonal food. Um, and that adds up to what um, uh, doctors or dietitians would say would be a healthy diet as well. Travel and transport, we need to think about you know, how do people get from A to B? It's partly the location where you would build homes. It's having sprawl has to be a thing of the past. We have to sort of densify around cities um, and towns, but that can be done in a way which still gives you your privacy and uh, we're not all feeling on top of each other, uh, especially if, if we're minimising the need to drive cars and, and have so many freeways and, and, uh, and parking spaces. Uh, it's really important to think about uh, the materials, 70% uh, of the impact of construction is in the construction materials. And we're going to hear a bit from Ian uh, on his project, uh, and his product, how that can help there. Zero waste, there shouldn't be any such thing as waste. We need to make it easy for people to recycle, which if you're a developer, it's often outside of your control. It's a local authority service, probably. But there are ways you can foster that, which also foster a sense of community, such as having a, a sort of intranet where you're uh, swapping and sharing goods, which also saves uh, residents money. And of course, we can't have one planet living without zero carbon energy use in the home. So we need to minimise down the amount of energy we need and then supply the remainder with uh, renewable energy. So those are the 10 principles and, and a little bit of an explanation of each one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and there are leaders around the world. At the moment, there are 24 leaders uh, in One Planet Living who are just going above and beyond and really exemplifying how we can create communities, businesses, places uh, where people are enabled to live a One Planet Living lifestyle. Uh, and you're going to hear about two of them now. So um, I'd like to... Um, hand over and introduce um, our first example or our first case study and speaker from Canada, um, Jonathan Westindy. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. I'm always... You saying, got it right. It's good. I got it right. Yeah. Good. Um, yes. Jonathan's uh, founder and CEO of the Windmill Development Group, um, who are recognised as one of Canada's most innovative eco-social real estate firms. You're the leading, I'd say. Um, Windmill and its wholly owned advisory sub subsidiary Urban Equation have been the lead developer or strategic advisor on Canada's most recognised and highest performing large scale sustainable real estate developments, including being the lead developer responsible for the initi initiation of the first LEED certified platinum community in Canada, Dockside Green in Victoria, and the first one planet living community in Canada, which is Zibi in Ottawa right by the Parliament building where all those truckers are out and about, we were saying today. So over to you, Jonathan. Uh, and then if you do have questions for Jonathan, do put them in the chat as we go along. Thank you. Thanks. I think we're going to start with a quick video here about uh, the fund. That this is our planet. It's the only one we have. But we know we have some problems. We are consuming natural resources at a rate 75% greater than the planet can replenish. If we all had European habits, we'd need three planets worth of resources to support our lifestyles. With the way we live in North America, we need five. But this is about more than consumption. No issue stands alone. You might be worried about pollution, climate change, inequality, global health. They are all interconnected. The challenge for the real estate sector is clear. We need a more holistic approach to designing and building our communities. Introducing the One Planet Living Fund, a Canadian closed end, mixed use opportunistic real estate development impact fund designed to accelerate implementation of impact investing principles in real estate while generating market returns. One Planet Living developments around the world have proven real estate can deliver impact, enabling people to live happy, healthy lives within the planet's capacity. With over 30 billion in real estate development in 20 countries over the last 16 years, the One Planet principles provide a roadmap for individuals, businesses, organizations, and governments to follow. The framework accounts for everything from integrated community engagement to sustainable water and minerals, zero carbon strategies, 
to urban food production, affordability to impact on local economies. If One Planet Living is the roadmap that's going to get us all to a truly sustainable way of life, the One Planet Living Fund is the engine that will start the electric car. We know the most impact happens early in a project's life cycle, when the plans and strategies first come together. That's when measurable indicators and common goals are set and business case objectives are laid out. Windmill is recognized as one of Canada's leading impact developers and has partnered with Epic Investment to manage the fund. Epic brings 17 billion of real estate assets under management across North America and a strong institutional base. The One Planet Living Fund team has the expertise and track record to cut through the complexity and deliver flexible, robust, and easy solutions for development partners, along with aligned capital to support them. With approximately one billion worth of projects in the pipeline, the One Planet Living Real Estate Fund bridges the gap between financial returns and demonstrable impact. Without action, the challenges we're all facing will become too much to overcome. But action is possible, and it starts by rethinking how, when, and what we invest in. How we live is shaped by where we live, and where we all live is on this one single solitary planet. Learn how you can invest in a better future with the One Planet Living Real Estate Fund. Okay, that's my presentation. No, <laughs> thank you uh, for that. I think James, you're gonna put up a slide next to flow through. So, just the um, we we've been working with um, Bioregional and had a long history now for uh, oh decade plus, and uh, you know we're we're first introduced to the One Planet Living framework in um, I, I think in California on uh, the Sonoma Mountain Village uh, and grow communities there through our advisory arm and uh, we, we've been working you know uh, with a focus you know the the uh, intent uh, thankfully the real estate discussions and capital discussions are getting more and more centered around sustainability but that's all we've ever done since our inception was to sort of be leaders in, in sustainability and sort of centered around the uh, lead framework initially but you know quickly realized that it's a great it's a great system rating system but it really is focusing on building performance and increasingly as as we look at the holistic view of health and wellness and and um, the uh, social impact you know really rallied around one planet living as as uh, the only framework we could find that really covers the full spectrum and provides clear metrics and and more so has really been effective as, as sort of a, a communication platform for us to rally all our ideas and, and engage with the community and and, and uh, polit politics and those sorts of things to all rally around uh, you know sort of one central focus so we uh through that um maybe just go to the next slide for a second so just you know our history is is uh we we created the first one planet which which was early eventually the first lead platinum communities in canada first lead platinum buildings and then through our experience and exposure with with uh the one planet living on the advisory side brought the first one planet living community to canada which is zivi which i'll touch on a little bit uh, later and now we have our second uh one planet living endorsed uh, community which is called baker street in in guelph and really through this, we were finding more and more a capital appetite to say, how can we invest in real estate in a responsible fashion and that can deliver, you know, returns and impact at the same time. So through that, we we structured a fund. This was uh, pre-COVID and impact real estate funds weren't that, uh, um, you know, so top of mind. Thankfully, there's there's it's a good thing. There's there's more coming out of, of the woodworks, but we, we worked with Bioregional to essentially uh, allow us to use the One Planet Living Framework as our lens to report our um, our project outcomes through through this fund vehicle, and uh, in exchange commit that all our projects will uh, seek to achieve uh, One Planet Living Global leadership um, uh, uh, outcomes, and and with that you know really rally the support. So then we we uh, as a, as a firm have done lots of development and and worked with capital on different natures, but we're really looking to take this as a platform that could, you know, get from high net worth individuals we deal with and, and uh, family offices to institutional uh, partners and other things and scale this to be something that, 
you know, we sort of see as a One Planet Living Fund one here in in where we are in Canada and growing that into multiple different uh, potential opportunities, both geographically and, and platform wise. So we were looking to find a partner to help us manage this that that had uh, a better track record as far as fund management and institutional pedigree and sort of brought that side of the equation to the table. So if you go to the next slide, uh, we were very fortunate in, in there's many years of sort of cultivating relationship to to tie up with Epic Investment Services, who are based out of Toronto. They have a North American footprint. Uh, as mentioned, they have about 17 and a half billion under management, and and just a very strong record, strong track record working with more of the institutional investor world. And you know, since we've formed this partnership and put this fund together, you know, it's incredible the how quickly the the sea has changed, and and you know what was sort of. Uh, an uphill battle to get people to look at this is is now something where it's it's uh, you know really coming and scrutinizing the the validity of the one planet living approach and and uh, its outcomes and you know th things that you know people were not really paying as much attention to so that's been fantastic. Uh, next slide. So all our projects that I mentioned will be will be uh, we have about a billion dollar pipeline. They're all seeking a one planet living uh, sort of uh, global leadership endorsement. And then you know we are working alongside in how we report that and and uh, through the the one planet living dot com dashboard as well and sort of trying to facilitate all that. But really it's about aggregating all this up into you know both project level reporting and those achievements, and then aggregating to a greater uh, level of impact as a as a fund capital uh, achievement. Next slide. And so we closed uh, close to $50 million uh, in the spring where we've, we've got uh, six projects now underway, um, all in, in sort of the Ontario uh, province in, in Canada. And we are working towards a second close for this fund one to be around 100 million, 100 to 125 potentially uh, in, in about two months. So we were, Still not too late. If anyone's on the call and interested in investing, please uh, please reach out. Uh, but we've been making great uh, traction, and and the um, the fund itself will end up probably having about ten different projects underway, uh, all in film mixed use uh, community type things. That's a five year turnaround from an investment cycle, and and everything being measured through the principles of the uh, of the one final framework. Next slide. And so just, you know, as an example, which this this project is not in the fund, this is a much bigger project, but this was the first one planet living community in Canada that uh, that we initiated. And, uh, you know, that framework took this this as a site in downtown Ottawa nation's capital, as Susan mentioned, uh, you'll hear the trucker horns from here quite well in, in the rallies going on right now and, and the bridges, bridges being blocked and that type of thing. So very central. Uh, and it was a contaminated site. It was a form of pulp and paper plant. Uh, it was a, a site that has a high degree of indigenous interest. The Algonquin Nation in, in uh, this geography area had it as, as sort of a sacred uh, area for different ceremonies historically and portage and that type of thing. Hence the name Zibi, which is Algonquin for river. And uh, we, you know, we we've had a lot of problems. It's on two different provinces. It has a federal oversight and a municipal oversight. So, for all intents and purposes, it was seen as an incredibly messy site. You know, to sort of move from where it was to to where it got. And the owner, Dom Tar, was really looking for a partner to work with who could bring the right lens to this and the right uh, sort of vision to the property to turn it from arguably a turd. To something the community can get very excited about, and and with that we applied the One Planet Living uh, framework. Uh, through that we were able to get uh, essentially a very strong support and, and productive discussion around what we wanted this to be versus your typical buildings are too high, too much traffic, all that kind of stuff. And you know, for sake of time, outcome we got our entitlements in uh, in, in record time for something that would have been seen to take years and years and years. Um, we at this stage the project is um, it, it's it's largely been remediated. There is now a, a zero carbon district energy system that is that is up and running thanks to Scott DeMarc who you might see in some videos that's describing that there on the site. Uh, and uh, you know from a from a social side of things there's about 48 different measures for example being accounted for in, in a partnership with the local Algonquin nations and you know we could go on and on and on in the sense of, of uh, and so there's annual reports available on the Zibi site sort of showing the initial plan and then the annual uh, annual plans from there and then the second project here if you want to slip to the next one this 
is that this is the second One Planet Living community in, in Canada. We are uh, seeking to break ground on this fall. And this was a partnership with the city of, of Guelph, which is just outside of Toronto. It's a, it's a very strong agricultural town, increasingly an ag tech town, and, and uh, also got a, a large federal grant for a closed loop food economy uh, project. And as a result, our main theme on this project is urban agriculture and partnering uh, on, on many fronts and awareness and education around uh, agriculture. And interestingly, as we did a, a carbon footprint exercise for the city of Guelph and its biggest footprint actually is food, uh, which is not surprising, but but sort of really educating on the different ways that you can you can um, bring that to bear. One of the things is as part of this project is, is it's a new municipal library. So we're working with that library as part of the project and their programming to really work through and educate and great greater awareness of the whole uh, sort of one planet living approach to, to things. So we have a, you know, we have a mandate for uh, bringing aligned capital, finding aligned projects and, uh, you know, doing what we all know we need to do, which is which is delivering real estate that can demonstrate the ability to live within the resources of our of our one planet. So that's sort of the overall summary of what we're doing. And as I said, if there's any interest in pursuing, maybe just go to the next slide. Um, my contact information is there and, and would love to uh, to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jonathan. That's really inspiring. Um, I mean, I noticed there similarly to uh, do post your questions in the chat or you can. Um, I'm not sure. Can people put their hand up, James? Can you people have questions? Um, yeah, feel free if, if people want to, to raise a hand and ask a question, you're welcome to or, or pop it in the chat. OK, um, so uh, I noticed how important it is to have that partnership with the community. Uh, the local government uh, and very much rooted in in the local area, uh, which is really admirable. And that was something that's, that's shown out from this morning's uh, seminar with the projects in Australia as well. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what, why do you think uh, what, what has Zibi being a global leader uh, meant for you? How has how has it? Yeah, how has it helped or? Well, we, we look at it in two fronts. I mean, on, on a educational point of view, Zibi has been a fantastic uh, implementation exercise for us to really appreciate the value of the One Planet Living Framework and how it can. So it's sort of that exercise, that that knowledge that allowed us to sort of move further in the idea of creating the One Planet Living Fund and, and really actively pursuing more projects on that front. Um, and, uh, you know, I think on, on the other hand, it comes with it a responsibility. So by, you know, Zibi being a global leader, then you need to make sure that the implementation is in place to to sort of get beyond the uh, nice statements which we hear lots of and actual you know demonstrating implementation and so i'd say by uh, being a global leader it also brings some pressure to the situation and ensuring uh, delivery of those and the team that is currently running zibi is doing a great job of that you know in in, in, in delivering that uh, and it's it's great i mean i think there's two things one it's great awareness for the project and the projects that we're pursuing uh but it also is is uh, a Existing in because in Canada and in North America, you know, one planet living isn't uh, a household uh, name or, or, or known, and and so uh, these things are all bringing greater awareness to the framework and its value in um, you know its, its its ability to sort of truly be a full spectrum uh, viewpoint to bring to the table in in achieving you know these 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 outcomes we're seeking with our real estate projects. It's interesting. We've been working with the city of Sarnich, who's uh, mm -hmm. using one planet living. I think yep. that was on Vancouver Island. I think. Yeah. Um, so it often feels like when somebody starts using one planet living somewhere, this little ecosystems <laughs> kicks off. So you never know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe there'll be some projects back on that side of the country for you. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's actually uh, our advisory arm, and, and uh, the other thing is, as much as we're using this through our fund, I mean, we we through our advisory arm are encouraging everyone we can to look and adopt, and so there is uh, some good traction actually with with another large project which you might hear about soon, soon uh, uh, up in in Calgary, which is just on the other side of the Rockies from from there, um, and uh, some uh, a few other projects that that you know through our advisory arm I think uh, will come through and and uh, further broaden the network of one planet living knowledge in, in Canada, which would be great. Great. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, I think, mm -hmm. oh, we have a question there. You said that um, James Birch has said that you said that Epic 
uh, had an uphill battle. How so? Was is there enough investment to be viable and also publicity? So just clarifying what you said there about working with Epic. And oh, I don't know if I said it was <laughs> I don't know if I said it was an uphill battle per se. I, I think I was more saying in our strength as a firm, we did not have the pedigree or connections into sort of more the institutional investors. So that part was an uphill battle for us and bringing Epic on as a partner essentially um, um, is what, what allowed us to, to sort of uh, find the right team structure to do that. So do you think that others could set up a one planet living fund to help fund their pipeline if they wanted to? Yeah, I mean, our Go goal was, was this One Planet Living Fund to be a showcase. And then, you know, our goal is is to, you know, facilitate more of these other ones that we are directly driving or helping to facilitate with others, because uh, I, I think the more the better. And, and uh, I do think it can be a great uh, sort of valuable structure. I think the challenge you're seeing more and more impact funds coming out and in real estate um, but sort of how they choose to measure and deliver the metrics of the impact they're making is, is you know, challenging for a lot. So this just provides a, a fairly clear, you know, sort of uh, outline of, of how we intend to report and measure ourselves uh, on our fund performance. And um, I've seen the project when it was sort of a building site and colleagues have visited, uh, but I guess people have moved in now. Um, and do you have any sort of resident stories or... How is it working out for the people who live there? Yeah, so there is uh, one building completed and people moved, uh, two buildings completed, people moved in, a third one going. Uh, generally, you know, the, then this is part of the exercise is going through the surveys, uh, you know, and as it relates to the sort of the health and happiness and other things. And, and uh, you know, gen generally the positive, the feedback is, is quite positive. We're not quite at the stage yet where you know, you're able to walk out your front door and you're not in the middle of a construction zone and, you know, you can go get your coffee and all that kind of stuff. We're still in a bit of a growing pain stage, but, uh, um, you know, overall it's been, it's been very uh, positive to date and it, it has taken uh, those uh, more adventurous to sort of get into something like this a little earlier because, you know, it, it's just going to increase in, in, uh, in value. And I'd say one of the most and again, I haven't been directly involved driving over the last two years. But what's been the most impressive is seeing you know a lot of the public realm and parks have been done with partnerships with the Algonquin Nations. A lot of the infrastructure has been designed and implemented, and um, yeah, the naming of that and and it really is bringing recognition to a special place that a lot of people in the city didn't even know about and and, and what its history was. Yes, a beautiful spot with where all those rivers come together and so close mm -hmm. to the House of Parliament. You've got to get all those politicians down. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it does It does help in getting attention. I mean, I know the, the district energy system got uh, a, a good uh, boost from, from some federal funding and things like that because it's, you know, what better place than right in the backyard of Parliament to show off, you know, where we got to go with, with some of these, uh, with, with, with the development cycle. So. Well, Jonathan, that's really inspiring. So hold on there and... Um, I think for everyone listening, you know, it shows how you can really create some amazing projects uh, and then start to develop a whole pipeline of amazing projects, bringing in the investment that's out there looking for a fund. And you heard there, Jonathan's interested uh, to replicate it in other locations, as we pass on the know-how. And by, uh, by regional, we'd certainly be interested for the right people to take it on and uh, run with it too. So um, now moving on, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Ian Pritchett, who is Managing Director of Green Core Construction, who design and build high performance homes for developers and landowners. And he has over 30 years experience in specialist construction. So over to you, Ian. Thanks, Sue. And thanks, Jonathan. That was really inspiring. And uh, this the the story that I'm going in the project I'm going to be talking about is on a much smaller scale but like you it's leading to a pipeline of, of greater opportunities and uh, links to institutional funding as well so I think there's a, a common theme there um, can we have the next slide please so I wanted to start off really by setting the context for where we are we're in Oxfordshire in the UK um, I don't know uh, exactly what the makeup of our audience is, but I expect most people are from the UK and know Oxfordshire. Um, so under our climate targets and, and climate change targets, we've we've got budgets for carbon emissions. 
And if you go to the Tyndall Centre for Climate Change and to their website, you can actually see what those carbon budgets are broken down to each local authority. And here in Oxfordshire, we've got five local authorities and we've got a total carbon budget of 26.3 million tonnes. So that's the amount of CO2 that we can emit or CO2 equivalent that we can emit from now until the end of this century. And that should be a focus for all of us to think about what we're doing within the context of that budget. Next slide, please. The elephant in the room in, in terms of these carbon budgets is embodied carbon because embodied carbon is the emissions that come from the extraction, quarrying, processing, manufacturing of materials, delivery to site and assembly into buildings and infrastructure. Next slide, please. And according to the Architects Climate Action Network, these represent about 10% of our UK's CO2 emissions. And we we don't really know because they're not measured. There's no requirement to measure them. There's nobody reporting on them and there's no framework at the moment for re reducing them. So there's a big chunk of our carbon emissions which are completely below the radar and, and unregulated, which is why I refer to it as the elephant in the room. Next slide, please. So. If we think about the, the embodied carbon, the emissions from all the materials and assembly of a house, for many years, the, the accepted view has been that it's about 50 to 60 tonnes of CO2 equivalent um, for every average house. And when we're talking about an average house, that's around 100 square metres of gross internal area. And that's often referred to as its carbon footprint. And then when we've built a house, in use, it will be emitting about five tonnes of CO2. So a house that we build this year will be responsible for a good 200 tonnes of emissions by 2050. So you can see that this is pretty inconsistent with a roadmap to zero carbon by 2050. We are still contributing to a problem when we can't afford to, to be making the matter worse. Next slide. Now, I mentioned that was the sort of accepted figure in the industry. In 2020, Taylor Wimpey published very bravely in their sustainability review that their average CO2 emissions, scope one, scope two and scope three emissions for an average square 100 square metre house was actually 209.8 tonnes. Now, Scopes one, two and three are subtly different to embodied carbon, but they still represent the carbon emissions from the construction of a house. So you can see that's wildly different from, from what we were thinking of as, uh, as the established um, figure in the industry. If we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, our estimate or the established wisdom in the industry was 50 to 60 tonnes. More recently, the RIBA, the Royal Institution of British Architects, have published a figure for business as usual, which they say is, a, is 1,200 kilos per square metre, which equates to 120 tonnes for that house. Or we've got the Taylor Wimpy figure of 210 tonnes. So they, they vary quite dramatically and we clearly need a lot more work in measuring embodied carbon and, and consistently measuring it in the same way and reporting against it. If we don't do that, we, we don't stand a chance of, of trying to get on top of this. Next slide, please. So David Attenborough has, has um, very clearly said what we do in the next 10 years will profoundly impact the next few thousand. So if we think about what's going to happen here in Oxfordshire in the next 10 years, there's best part of 100,000 new houses planned. So if, if the established wisdom figure of 50 to 60 tonnes of emissions at the construction stage and five tonnes in use per year is accurate, then those 100,000 new houses will squander 80% of Oxfordshire's carbon budget over the next 10 years. And that budget isn't just for housing, that's for not just for new housing, that's for all our existing buildings, industry, transport, agriculture, everything that happens in Oxfordshire. So that's pretty worrying. But actually, even worse than that, if the Taylor Wimpy figures are, are right, then we will use 100% of that budget within 10 years. 
So business as usual is no longer viable. Can we move to the next slide, please? So the problem is that when most people are talking about zero carbon, what they're really referring to is operational emissions. They're aiming to get the operational emissions down to, to zero. But we've really got to tackle this embodied carbon as well as the operational emissions. It isn't just one or the other. We've got to be doing both at the same time. If we move to the next slide, please. So fortunately, I think in the short term, one of the advantages we've got here is that trees and other plants all capture carbon dioxide as they grow and they turn it into cellulose and we can use that cellulose for a range of products, not just construction based, but but certainly we'll focus on construction here. Uh, next slide, please. So if you actually work through the, the maths and the chemistry of photosynthesis in plants, it actually takes 1.8 kilograms of CO2 to make a kilo, kilogram of cellulose and it that First of all, you probably think, well, how can that be true? It's because the plants take that molecule of carbon linked to two oxygen atoms and they break it down. The oxygen goes back to the atmosphere and the carbon becomes locked up in the cellulose. So in very simple terms, the more bio based materials we incorporate in buildings, the more carbon we lock up. And the big premise there is that these have got to be sustainably sourced and replaced with more bio based materials as they're harvested. Next slide, please. So the the leading um, methodology for measuring embodied carbon net is now emerging as the RICS um, tool. And there are two things they say that you have to do in order to be able to consider this uh, locked up or sequestered carbon. The first thing you've got to do is to make sure that it's you're harvesting hemp and timber and things from sustainable sources where where there is replanting at least the same number of trees. And we've also got to consider what happens at the end of the life of the building as well. We've got to be designing for uh, reuse, recycling, or ultimately we may even find that in 100 years time or 200 years time when these buildings come to the end of their life, that the materials might be used for generating energy, but the carbon will be captured in, in any sort of combustion process. And so on the left here, you can see the carbon profile of trees as they grow and then get harvested and then get turned into products, locked up in a building, and then you reach this point at the end of the life where the, that carbon can either be locked up for an ongoing period if it's reused or recycled, or it gets released back to the atmosphere if it's if it's just burnt in a, a straightforward combustion process. So we clearly don't want that to happen. We mustn't let that happen. Uh, that carbon needs to be locked up. Um, and then on the right hand side, you've got uh, the carbon footprint of, of a house. So first of all, the carbon emissions go up through the construction stage and then they become balanced out by the regrowing of the trees and the plants that you have uh, used. And then they cross the, the, the axis and they become zero and they start to get to better than zero. You're locking up more carbon than is emitted. And then you reach a point where the building comes to the end of its life. And again, either that carbon can be released or it can be locked up for a longer period of time. So if we move to the next slide, we have, had WSP do some embodied carbon studies on typical houses for us and, and what they found is that we're locking up 340 kilos of CO2 for each square meter of floor area at the construction stage that's the upfront embodied carbon and if we look at it as a whole life uh, we're locking up 278 kilos because through the life of the building you've got more carbon emissions that come from the maintenance of the building and there's some uncertainty about how much is released at, at the end of life of the building. So this gives us a benchmark that we can start to say, how can we improve on that? Use shorter rotation plants such as hemp instead of timber or, or use bamboo instead of timber and, and look at the end of life. Next slide, please. So the choices that we make in, in our design of buildings um, don't just affect what the building looks like or its thermal performance, but they affect its carbon footprint. And we now know that we can clearly build buildings that have got zero carbon footprints and zero emissions. And that's what we should be trying to do. So next slide, please. So this brings us on to the subject development, Springfield Meadows. 
This is 25 houses, nine affordable and 16 sold on the open market. And phase one set out to have zero carbon footprint and net zero energy in use. And then through phase two, we've managed to get better than zero uh, carbon footprint and uh, net zero energy in use. So the targets here were zero carbon footprint, we were using the passive house standard as a guidance, but these are not certified as passive houses, but even so they've got minimum heating requirements. And the other thing about passive house, it's all about comfort and health as well. Net zero energy in use, which obviously helps lower the energy bills, but by going to electricity instead of gas, you're, you're paying more. So you need to be aware that low energy in use doesn't necessarily mean low cost in use at the moment because we don't have a level playing field between different energy sources and then the scheme has an electric car club and there will be a car sharing scheme as well we've got a partnership with the bucks barks and oxen wildlife trust and the key thing here all of this is brought together under the one planet living framework so there's a tendency as i've just done to get very hung up on carbon and energy and things uh, but we find the One Planet Living Framework grounds us in all the softer skills of health and happiness and community and food and waste and water. All the things that are easy to overcome when you're builders and scientists and engineers and, and things. So we find the One Planet Living uh, Framework really, really useful in this sense. And this is the second One Planet Living project that we've done. And we're committed to doing every project as a One Planet Living project. So if we move to the next slide, the, the formula is very simple. It's not secret. Um, we use bio-based materials to lock up carbon. We use the principles of the passive house performance uh, methodology to get energy in use down. And then we make sure that we've got an electric heating, hot water and cooking strategy and lots of PVs on the roof to generate the energy. And in some cases, batteries to store it, whether they're site wide or, or individual houses. And the next slide. So during the process of doing this project, um, we've moved from having zero carbon footprint to better than zero carbon. And we realized that getting to zero is not going to be enough going forward. What we've got to do is undo some of the damage that's been done in the past. So we've come up with this concept that we call climate positive, which is about locking up more carbon, generating more energy, massively increasing wildlife and biodiversity, and trying to do enough houses in a concentrated area that it becomes a catalyst for local food and green transport and also local community energy schemes as well. So all of this fits really nicely within the One Planet Living Framework. Unfortunately, Oxfordshire has a scheme that it's going to be the first One Planet Living County in the world. There is this scheme called One Planet Oxfordshire. And so we're really lucky to be working in Oxfordshire. And I think that's the last slide if you want to move on to the next one. So we, uh, I think this was Abraham Lincoln said the best way to predict the future is to create it. And so we think working within the One Planet Living Framework, One Planet Oxfordshire, we can really start to create the future here in Oxfordshire. And those ripples will spread out across the country and the world, hopefully. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Ian just tremendous and if, if anyone ever gets the chance to go and visit I don't know do you do guided tours yet you always got hordes of media and winning um, down there. we we're happy to do tours anytime yes we like to send politicians to see you don't we and they you keep do. finding yes. you as well yeah we like we like to have politicians yes because yes. yeah. I can see you're you're all in it well we know you're in it for the purpose um this is a good way to have a life to have a a life's work that's very rewarding and has a purpose like that so it's incredibly mm. impressive um you've got a few questions in the chat nice. here which are Good. quite technical so uh what accounts for such a large gap between the embodied carbon between green core and taylor wimpy um and then some very specific questions about i don't know if you can see them in about clear definitions for end of life calculations for timber um and the ec impact sure what that would be of new technologies as well heat pump pv and battery storage yeah that's interesting we were a colleague we were talking about that today the embodied impact of batteries is huge yes uh, so i think there's a lot of 
if if we take first of all the embodied carbon impact of those new technologies they all need to be looked at and and there's a danger at the moment that um, they're not uh, fully included in in the methodologies because they're generating energy themselves they they sit outside that embodied ca carbon calculation so there's there's work to do on standardizing all of this and the question about what's such a big difference between ours and Taylor Wimpy, uh, I don't honestly know. Um, the I, I have a feeling that uh, theirs is very much masonry and concrete based, which are all emitters. Ours is timber and wood fibre and hemp based, which are all uh, sequestering carbon. Um, but it might be also that uh, different methodologies have been used and and they haven't been standardized to each other which is why i said earlier we need to to do more work on measuring and reporting and comparing and looking at these differences because we really need to know where we're going on this and there is um a world green building council zero net zero pathway uh, which is looking at zero embodied carbon well, I think the work is beginning and people are signing up to it. So I, I think it is. There's also some good work being done by Letty, the yes. London Energy Transition Initiative, um, who have a, a target for embodied carbon, including sequestration to be minus 100 kilos per square metre by 2050. Um, so yeah. we're all sort of heading in the, the right direction. Um, we've got a question from Stuart Delgano who says, "Is there are there clear definitions for end of life calculations for timber? There, there are clear definitions within certainly within the the RICS methodology, um, but it's it's very subjective. So what what you have to to do is show that." you are considering and planning for end of life and and the three scenarios we look at are reuse of of those components first and foremost recycling of the components if they can't be reused and third um, combustion to generate energy with carbon capture if if neither of those first two things are, are possible so um, it it requires a bit of a crystal ball really to say in 100 or 200 years when this building comes to the end of its life what are people going to do with it but i think there has to be some um acknowledgement that people are going to get more carbon savvy in the future than we are at the moment and probably a shortage of resources as well. yes maybe i mean i know with bricks mm. the mortar is an issue so with the sort of mortar we use today it's quite hard to get the mortar off the bricks it, so it is yes with your product ian do can the timber panels be basically disassembled they they can yes yes and that's that's what we uh, are aiming for people to do okay yes, so timber panels and cross laminated timber floors as well that we use so um james richardson has asked how do you approach building homes for a zero carbon footprint while also providing affordable or attainable options well, we take exactly the same view on affordable houses as as we do um, on private houses. They're, they're built in the same way to the same standards. So it's really about the economic model across the whole site. You know, the, the affordable houses uh, certainly cover the construction costs and maybe a little bit more, but there, there isn't much fat in it to contribute to land value or, or infrastructure. So you've really got to be covering the cost of land value and infrastructure from the private houses. Um, and I think it will take uh, quite a few projects to, to really drive down the cost of the supply chain to, to be really profitable. But I think the economics still stack up at the moment and we're certainly seeing at least 10 percent higher value achieved for the finished houses than than ordinary houses in the area they are very beautiful and uh, you i hear you just received a huge investment is it from a pension fund uh, is yeah, that we, help we haven't to... received it we 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 have received uh, a very nice investment from a pension fund but they've also committed to um to uh provide another 500 million in uh, funding for climate positive houses across the uk over the next three to five years so we're working with m and g 
um, to deliver lots and lots of climate positive houses over the next five years. That's fantastic. So doing two small projects and having built, you've got your factory going and you did your own, built your own house that way as well, didn't you? Mm, we've done about 60 houses over the last eight years, but they've been concentrated in two or three substantial projects really over the last five years. Um, so will and the new investment drive the prices down, do you think? It will do, yes. Well, it, the investment will drive the volumes up and the volumes will drive the prices down. Okay. Yes. So, uh, but we are in this strange world at the moment where prices are under a lot of pressure from global supply chains that uh, are a little bit beyond our control. We've got about three minutes to do. Well, maybe we could go on a little bit longer. Um, we've got quite a few questions here. Um, so, Ian, what can you say? Catherine uh, Budget Meekin is asking, what can you say about the usual mass new home house developments taking all place all over the place? and what ecological controls exist for that part of the housing sector. I think that links to the post that Jane Durney put in at the top of the chat about uh, transport for homes. Uh, I can't think, I think that was what it was called, saying we can't have this sprawl and uh, explaining well, why it's a bad thing. I think there are two, two sides to this, aren't there? There are people like us and, and Jonathan who really want to disrupt the existing status quo and try and do something better. And I think we've got to do enough of it and make enough noise that uh, politicians and legislation start to, to demand it. Um, the, the problem is that the house building industry doesn't follow the normal laws of supply and demand because it's, it's linked to land availability and planning permission and mortgage funding and scarcity. And there are all sorts of complications in the house building market. So I think it's going to take a while for the the volume house builders to to really get to the point where they either want to do this voluntarily or they're forced to do it but the the more people like us and there are other companies like this doing the same thing the more we can do the the faster we can bring that forward and i think when you're pioneering i know from our own developments it's sometimes quite hard to get planning permission when you're trying to pioneer because the local government doesn't always understand what you're trying to achieve um, which um, I think One Planet Living helps with. <laughs> I, I think exactly. People often say to me, is it difficult to build zero carbon houses? And I normally say that's the easy bit. It's all the things that go around it. You know, the 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 planning permission, the, the funding, the uh, people management, the, all, all of those things are, are the hard bits. Actually building the houses is pretty straightforward. OK, let's see if we can just take those. Uh few more. Yeah, shortage of labour and skills in building to this standard. I saw when I was on site how you have trained. The contractors come on and they know they sit, they know what they've got to do to make it airtight, but how hard is that to get the skill? It, it takes a little little bit of training and it takes a little while, but I think it's more about care than skill. And it's a it's a mindset and it's getting that across. You don't have to be highly skilled to make buildings airtight, but you do have to care about what you're doing. Um, so there's there's going to be um, a need to grow the supply chain of, of people able to do that at the same rate as we grow the, the projects. And, uh, you know, it's a, a bit of a chicken and egg, and it's one of the, the arguments that the volume house builders use that the skills are not available. Well, until you create the demand, the skills won't be there. So you've got to try and grow the two things at the same time. We've found competition to be really good, um, having different teams of people working on air tightness, trying to outdo each other, because one of the great things about air tightness is you get a number at the end of it that your your number is either better than your competitors or not. And, uh, and so that means you can measure and create competition in people. And we found that that's really good, positive competition. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and there's quite a long comment here from Willow, so I'm just looking to see. I think she's talking. So how you adapt the building during its life, not just reusing the materials, because obviously you don't want to puncture those membranes. Whether things like heating and insulation will work if you adapt the building. And there are some issues with passive house approaches that can mean it's hard to adapt the building. 
Yeah, they're all relevant points, and I think there's a lot of learning that uh, we all need to go through on that. I, I can't honestly say that I've got all the answers for that at the moment. Um, I, I hope what we're doing is robust enough to be adapted and, and grow with the changing use and changing requirements over time, but only time will tell, really. We try to keep things as simple as possible, so I think the, the fabric first approach is a, a good one that um, we we don't rely on hugely complicated technologies and um, it is about getting the fabric right. And I think also um, working with uh, or explaining to residents so that they don't sort of bang a nail in the wrong place, perhaps. Do, do you have to do any of that? Um, or can they just bang a nail in anywhere? They, we, we encourage them not to, but it's not the end of the world because uh, ours are fully breathable walls. So the, the membranes we use are vapour permeable, which means if somebody punctures it, you might get a little bit of leakage, but it's not a disaster because you're not concentrating huge amounts of water vapour through a hole in a membrane. Um, you know, a good friend of mine, Neil May, used to use this term, buildings need to be hackable, and uh, and they are hackable. We'd rather people didn't hack at them, but if they do, it's not going to ruin the building. I'm going to take one more because it feels really important. In the UK, we had a terrible tragedy, uh, the Grenfell fire which has led to everyone becoming very, very worried about fire. Um, so Ian, uh, Julian is asking, with the post Grenfell pressure on removing timber from construction, do you see any problems with that and with the mortgage industry? Um, there, there are definitely problems, but they're mainly confined to city developments, urban developments rather than rural developments, which is where we're tending to, to operate. So. Um, low rise and medium rise in rural environments doesn't seem to be affected at all. I think in in urban environments there's been a, a massive backlash and um, in in many cases um, you know uh, an unreasonable backlash that isn't driven by the science it's just driven by the horror of, of what happened at Grenfell and and uh, um, and then trying to uh, apply inappropriate rules to, I mean, mass timber, for example, cross laminated timber in, in medium rise buildings in, in cities is not a fire risk. It, it's very, very difficult to set something like that alight, but, uh, but it has suffered. And I think it'll take quite a few years for that to recover, if ever. Now, if, thank you, Ian. If everybody doesn't mind, um, we're going to go over to Joe and then we can come back to any questions that we haven't answered yet and have a bit more of a discussion in the round uh, with Jonathan um, and Ian. So, Joe, could you tell us a bit? Joe is um, uh, our One Planet Living lead at Bioregional uh, and supports partners and anyone. As I said, it's free for people to use. Um, and we also offer advisory support if needed. Um, but Joe's going to tell you a bit more about that now. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Ian and Jonathan. It's great to hear those inspirational stories of, of One Planet Living leaders around the world. Um, and I wanted to start by sharing uh, with you our exciting new Leaders Hub, which is a uh, one stop shop on our website um, for all the One Planet Living leader projects that are around the world, of which, as Sue mentioned, there's about 24. So James is going to walk you through very briefly here um, our new our new hub. Um, you can scroll through uh, and and see all the all the leaders, global and and uh, national. We have a, a, a filterable option so that you can uh, search and filter through those leaders, uh, past and present. Um, hopefully James is going to select one for you right now to to have a look at in a sec. So there we go. We filtered. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, it's allowing you to have a look at all those examples um, via your region or via your sector. And look, there's Springfield Meadows uh, on the screen right now. Um, videos and uh, uh, blog posts, all that sort of stuff. And of course, um, importantly, its achievements, its action plan. So what it what it set out to do, and then our annual review or our review of their progress um, as well. So all of that sits on our website inside our new leaders hub. The link has just gone in the chat, so if you'd like to have a look at that, please do, um, maybe once we've finished the session today. What are leaders? Well, they're projects uh, around the world that have um, had their action plan reviewed by us, by Bioregional. They're projects that we see as achieving the gold standard in sustainability. They're projects that effectively are achieving one planet living. And what is a leadership review? 
uh, a leadership review is is when we take your uh, your action plan um, and we and we review it. But of course, we're not we're not doing a, a lead or BRIAM uh, style assessment. We are not uh, doing a tick box exercise. We are um, we consider your context and act as a mentor or coach to, to walk with you through the process. And as we as we review your action plan, we'll, we'll work with you to improve it, and to spot the gaps and to make it better. How do you become a leader? Um, so sorry, what is a leadership review? So as I say, we review the action plan as a whole. We evaluate it against several criteria, um, including impact, systems change, uh, and the one planet living goals. Um, and and we, we use our goals and guidance as the gold standard there. And then we, as I say, we discuss uh, your action plan um, uh, with you and work out whether it could be a candidate for leadership recognition, either global leader or, or leader in your, in your nation. That's how that works. There are several benefits to becoming uh, a leader. Entry into um, a network of projects, two of which you've seen today, uh, uh, and, and theoretically you'd be as good as these these two examples. There's a we, ha we have a platform to showcase your work, including uh, some support on communications um, uh, and marketing from us. Use of the uh, the One Planet Living logo reserved only for leaders. You can put that on your marketing material um, as well. Additional um, evidence to show your key stakeholders, including potentially planning authorities or others. And knowledge fundamentally that you're contributing to solving the biggest challenge of our time, the climate and ecological crisis as well. So how do you go about it? How do you become a leader? And um, this, this slide probably looks more complicated than it is, but you create an action plan uh, for your development ideally using One Planet Living, but if you're not, don't worry too much about that. We can do the work to make it, to convert you to One Planet Living. Um, and we, what, you, what we want you to do is to say to us why you think you are a leader. Why is your project up there with the best of them? Why are you changing, um, changing the system around you and, and really pushing ahead like Jonathan and Ian have done? Well then, um, you then submit that action plan to us. We do a review, we read it, look at it. Uh, we might do uh, a review of other documents. We may visit your site, which we have done for Ian. Uh, we may do interviews with your uh, with your team um, as well. And then importantly, we're gonna feed back and suggest improvements for your action plan at that stage, making sure that everything is considered and nothing slips through the gaps. Then your action plan could be submitted for leadership recognition um, and we will, our, our senior team will review uh, the reviewer's output and decide whether it's a global or national leader. Finally, and importantly, publish and communications. Um, in One Planet For One Planet Living, we like transparency. We like action plans to be published and we will always publish the review of action plans as well. All of those available on our hub. And once those have been published, we can, uh, we can then shout about your achievements, shout about your development, either potential or actual, and start to do communications work with you, uh, events such as this and others. So that is how to become a leader. And if you are interested, uh, my details are at the end of this presentation. So do get in contact or drop a, uh, have a little look at our leadership hub. Um, there's, a, there's ways to, to contact us through there as well. Sue, I think that uh, that covers it. Thank you, Joe. That was a really good um you managed to get us back on track actually. I didn't mean for you to have to hurry up so much, sorry. Uh, very, it's great to actually, one of the things we like about it is learning from each other. So to see what someone else has done and to learn from each other as we all sort of step out there on that leading edge, uh, which we don't want to be a bleeding edge. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and share experiences. In fact, I remember, Jonathan, I think it was you, Jonathan, or, or your, one of your colleagues, uh, we we were very transparent about what happened at Bedstead and we had a small combined heat and power plant and it was too small to be viable and uh, based on wood and you said oh that was good that saved us from putting that one of them in uh, so, <laughs> so um, does it, if anyone has any questions for Joe, uh, Ian or Jonathan I think if uh, Ian and Jonathan uh, could could join us we'll, we'll uh, and Joe do, do join in um, we can have a look at some of those uh, questions that we didn't quite get to. Um, so um, there was a question about retrofitting buildings. So that's really important too, uh, from Catherine Budget Meakin. So I'm not sure if the Green Core product or if Jonathan, you uh, obviously we know we need to do it. And I think the key thing is how to do it without government subsidy or with a minimal government subsidy. Uh, certainly in the UK we're a bit stuck uh, because the government's just leaving it to the market or for a 
very people on very low incomes. So, Ian, do you have any? Can you answer um, a Catherine's question there? Is, is that something that you've looked into at all? Um, well, well, first of all, what we do at Greencore isn't necessarily transferable to to retrofit, but but I do think that the learning and, and knowledge and increasing the number of people who are um, skilled in in zero carbon building will then feed into the retrofit uh, agenda, and uh, some of the materials are suitable. Um, some of them are not. So um, if we think about natural materials, there are some great internal wall um, insulation systems and external wall insulation systems based on, on wood fibre board. Um, there are good insulation materials. So um, retrofit generally means that you're going to have to upgrade the fabric of the building uh, as well as um, as well as dealing with things like air tightness and, and services strategies. The, the problem is that it is disproportionately expensive and an awful lot of buildings are unique one-offs, e even those that, that appear to be relatively standard. You know, they have windows in different places. They've been subject to different modifications over the years. They've got drain pipes in different places. So it's very, very difficult to come up with standard solutions. And and realistically, I think it's going to take quite a few years and. The the our stock of existing buildings, I think, will will fall into three different categories, those that are relatively economic to to upgrade. Those that are virtually impossible to economically upgrade and will end up being replaced. And I think those that are of cultural significance where upgrade is is not viable, but replacing them is not, is not uh, an option. And we've got to be looking at, at zero carbon sources of energy for those sort of buildings. So it that sounds a bit broad brush and um, and a bit glib, I suppose. But but that's the way I see it happening. And I think it's going to take quite a few years to get there. Jonathan, thanks Ian. Jonathan, is that something that you work on? Yeah, so so retrofits are sort of part of the mandate of fund. We have had experience uh, in in doing retrofits. Uh, really, you know, one one example was downtown Toronto. It was a three hundred and sixty thousand square foot office building that we sort of moved at that time from being a nineteen sixties energy hog to to lead gold performance building. So I was really dealing more with with uh, operating energy and and not which I think is a critical thing to be looking at uh, so much the embodied carbon, that type of thing, but it is your your best starting point. And what was interesting with that, though, and I think what what, you know, a lot of what was said is very true, uh, but but it really needs to look at be looked at. So what what paid for a lot of that was the benefit of, for example, that building had an old mechanical system that took two floors of space and with more efficient equipment and that sort of thing, we were able to to um, reduce it to one floor mechanical space and turn one that one floor into new office space, income office space, which generated enough surplus income to pay for all the premiums of, of uh, you know, reskinning, doing those sort of things. And then other little things like in replacing the windows uh, on the retail of the ground floor, you know, the original windows were on the inside of the column. And by putting them on the outside of the column, this is $300 a square foot rental area. You can, so it needed to be really looked at both in, in the accretive revenue that can happen as well as the economics. And, and the hardest part, as, as was said, is, uh, there's very little replicability. It's all one offs and, and challenging. So you have to sort of find those right circumstances. And then it has to get driven, I think, by some standardization of, of metrics that need to be achieved. I can say in Canada, there's some benefit. The Canadian Infrastructure Bank has just uh, introduced a, a sort of a, a favorable uh, retrofit program that provides, uh, you know, very low interest in other benefits if you can demonstrate your retrofit is going to hit certain performance targets and energy targets and those sorts of things. So that is driving, uh, especially amongst some of the larger institutional investors, some decent activity here in the marketplace. That's great to hear. Yeah, we have some incentives for technology here in the UK, uh, but n not so much for the uh, improving the, the the energy performance of, of the building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After we've done a few retrofit projects uh, here at Bioregional and we're, we're currently working on some statewide retrofit programs and I loved what you said Jonathan you're obviously a great businessman because uh, you know you're just really thinking about it yes you've got these um, 
it just shows you that sustainability and going net zero on one planet living is compatible with uh, some wins like you know looking for those opportunities to get the extra value from the extra space mm-hmm. not always not possible with every building but uh, yeah if you're creative and problem solve your way through it it's just amazing what you can achieve um there was a question about what are those things on top of the building on the slide there they are the wind driven ventilation system because uh Ed said Eco Village, where I'm speaking from, uh, is uh, a Boroughshire project, um, is uh, very airtight, as, as like Ian's and uh, Jonathan's homes. And just thinking, what else did we miss here? A lot of compliments for your houses, guys. <laughs> Thank you. So I think. Um, you know, perhaps we've drawn to a natural, arrived at a natural point to um, close the session, unless there's anything um, you feel moved to say. Um, anyone? Oh, Joe wants to tell us about training. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, so if you've been inspired to use One Planet Living on your uh, project and you're not quite sure where to start, perhaps our um, online training may be a good place. Um, for a, a snip at a couple of hundred quid, you can join us for four sessions at one and a half hours each on Zoom, and we'll walk through the process that we've used for the last 20 years in action planning using the framework. Um, and uh, if you if you join us on that journey, you may even end up with uh, an action plan at the back of it. Um, but yeah, that training is available. Our next session start in March. Thanks, Joe. Um, and they're very interactive and quite fun. And I think one of the things I like about the work that we do is it's interesting and it's fun. I mean, it's not to say it's without its challenges, but uh, uh, yeah, I remember working with a developer in China and he said we had so much fun with the workshops and, and coming up with how we were going to problem solve through it. So uh, there's that as well. So um, now is definitely the time that we need those uh, carbon positive homes uh, that Ian talked about where we're enabling people to live a one planet living lifestyle. So uh, I just, I suppose to everyone who's joined us on the webinar today, it's really important to think in your daily life, in your work, uh, how are you, how are you going to help move society um, to actually achieve, achieve these goals? Because it is something that all of us um, want to take responsibility for on this call, I think. Um, so um, do join in, do your own action plan, become a leader, we invite you. Uh, thank you so much to our inspiring speakers, Jonathan Westein, uh, Andy and Pritchett, incredible guys. You just, uh, I love what you do. Um, we had a uh, session this morning. Um, I'm not sure if we're sharing that as well. Uh, James, are we sharing both recordings? With yeah, we were, yeah, they'll both, both be shared. Uh... Hopefully by the end of the week, they were up on the blog for everyone to, to watch back. OK, so if you missed the one this morning, you can hear about uh, Fremantle, the city of Fremantle, what they're doing and some developments in Australia uh, together with. Um, oh, it's gone right out of my head <laughs> what did this morning. Elmsbrook. Uh, Elmsbrook, which is a project that by region have been very heavily involved in the eco town in Bista, uh, here from our own Lewis Knight. So um, thanks everyone and um, for attending and uh, really wish you every success in your journey uh, to all of this together, creating a sustainable world. Thank you very much. And thanks to the tech team too.